Hello, my name is Thomas, and today we are dealing with Proposition 7 of Leibniz's work on the arithmetic quadrature of the circle, parabola, and hyperbola. And in Proposition 7, all the findings of Proposition 1 through Proposition 6 are basically accumulated in order to prove the equality of uh, the semicircular area with the resecting figure area and uh, we're gonna start right away. So first of all we're using the very same construction principle which we elaborated on in proposition 6 already. We draw out the semicircular curve, we place a bunch of points on it, we draw the ordinates of these points, we draw the tangents of these points such that they intersect the conjugate axis up here at the points t1, t2, etc. <coughs> and from these t points we're dropping verticals and the same principle we apply with the secants of uh, consecutive points. Uh, these secants also intersect the conjugate axis at the points m1, m2, etc. <coughs> And also from these M points, we are drawing uh, verticals. And now we can assign the points, which then make up uh, the elementary rectangles and the what's been previously termed the quadrilinear shapes. And um, <coughs> instead of drawing out a quadrilinear shape right now, um, Leibniz was uh, inscribing uh, triangles. The triangle as the simplest form of a polygon. <coughs> he inscribed uh, uh, in this way that he connected two consecutive points and the apex point of the semicircular curve and he obtains this way a sectorial triangle. And if we draw in the next step an elementary rectangle as we have done already in Proposition 6. So if you have not watched Proposition 6 already I encourage you to do so and you will know how the construction of the rectangle is uh, being done. And uh, if you remember the finding from Proposition 1 uh, we know that uh, the area of the sectorial triangle is equal to the half of the uh, area of the elementary rectangle. And uh, you can uh, go through this proof in uh, Proposition 1. So for here and now it is an established fact that the purple uh, sectorial triangle is the same as half the area of the elementary rectangle. And since this is the case for one particular ordinate interval between uh, two consecutive points on the semicircular curve, this principle can be applied on the intervals between all the other points as well. <coughs> and because the relationship is true for one ordinate interval, it will also be true for the others according to the proof in Proposition 1. And from this we know that the sum of all these uh, triangles is equal to the half of the area of this green stair-shaped area being made up of all the elementary rectangles created by those points we introduced. And uh, since we established this relationship in the finite, <coughs> we can now start placing an arbitrary number of points on the curve and draw out the corresponding um, sectorial triangles, still in purple, and the corresponding elementary rectangles in green. And the more points you place on the semicircular curve, the area which is made up of all these sectorial triangles in purple and all the uh, 
rectangles, uh, elementary rectangles in green, are going to converge to uh, to areas. The triangles converge to uh, the semicircular figure itself, while the sum of all the elementary rectangles converges to uh, the resecting figure. And uh, this is a very good example that uh, the relationship uh, still holds. So if you even if you place an arbitrary number of points on this curve, and uh, we elaborated on this principle uh, to some degree in Proposition 6 already. So knowing that one of these uh, triangles is equal to the corresponding elementary rectangles, and hence that the sum of all of those must also be equal to the sum or to half of the sum of all the areas of the elementary rectangles. So this principle remains no matter how many points I place on the semicircular curve. <coughs> so in this way, it becomes clear that when I place an infinite number of points on the semicircular curve and therefore make the ordinate intervals infinitely small, that the relationship uh, still holds and that uh, I get very close to a curved figure on both parts, on the semicircular part and the resecting figure part. And by knowing that these areas, even if they appear as curved figures to us, can be treated as sums of infinitely small rectangles or infinitely small triangles, of which we know a relationship between those two, we uh, can also anticipate that uh, the uh, relationship between the curved semicircular figure and the curved resecting figure is the same as between the finite uh, um, sectorial triangle and the finite uh, elementary rectangle, namely that the purple area being the semicircular figure is half the size of the area of the resecting figure. And this is what um, needed to be proven and this, the proof of this is actually the purpose of this proposition but it also demonstrates once more that um, the infinitesimals, or when you go to the infinitely small, <coughs> um, the subject matter <coughs> is not about quantities anymore, but it is about principle. And the principle here being that an elementary rectangle is double the size to its corresponding um, sectorial triangle. And therefore, we can also, when we get to the realm of the infinite, say concludingly that uh, the curved areas are having the same relationship to each other. And this needed to be proven, of course. And uh, what Leibniz did, uh, as other people before him also did, but in a different way, was using an indirect proof which is uh, also called uh, the deduction ad absurdum, where it is basically uh, the opposite of something that needs to be proven is stated or assumed, and then it is shown that what has been assumed is wrong. And in this case, we assumed, Leibniz assumed that the difference between these two areas has some value <clears throat> and then he proves that it actually cannot have uh, a certain value, that the difference between these two areas is uh, non-existent. And we're going to elaborate on this proof now. So first of all, let's have a look at the, these two sectorial triangles and its corresponding elementary rectangles. So, and by the means of proposition one, we know that the 
purple area, this polygon, is basically the double of this uh, green star-shaped area. And if you place, if you imagine that you place between point C1 and uh, C3 an infinite number of um, uh, sectorial triangles, you actually obtain the, or oh, get close to the circular curve itself, such that you get a trillineum, which is bound by uh, the lines A, C1, the curve from C1 to C3, and then the line C3 to uh, A again. On, on part of the um, green figure, which is a part of the resecting figure, which we call quadrilinear shape, <coughs> it is also bound by the uh, upper and lower ordinates, the axis, and then a part of the curve, which is um, a part of the resecting curve. And we know that this can be approached from the viewpoint of considering these areas as sums of uh, infinitely small uh, elementary rectangles. And this area, this trillineum, as a sum of infinitely small uh, sectorial triangles. And in the proof, we go through a sequence of steps in order to um, uh, say, um, state or prove that the relationship is actually true, S that the area of this curved trillineum purple and the double of it is equal to the curved quadrilinear shape here. And therefore we make a couple of assumptions first. So the um, quadrilinear shape, the green one, is actually named uh, Q. And then we have a, a term P, which we say is the area of this uh, stair-shaped figure which is uh, the sum of all the corresponding elementary rectangles. And this term P is actually also equal to the double of this uh, uh, polygon as a sum of all the sectorial triangles. And this we already know from proposition one. So this is an established and already uh, proven fact, which we can rely on. And we call T basically the double of this uh, trillineum, the curved um, sector, which we now um, were highlighting in red here. And yeah, we keep this as a term T. So the assumption is now made for the indirect proof that the difference between T being the double of the purple sector and Q the uh, quadrilinear shape, the green one, is actually some value set. And then we assume that uh, the difference between this uh, stair-shaped area and this uh, curvilinear area is uh, smaller than a quarter of this difference set. And the same applies to the polygon and uh, the curved uh, trillineum of the sector. So we arrange our points and their distance in such a way that we know that uh, the uh, difference between the polygon, the discrete sort of polygon, and the uh, curved, continuously curved trillineum is uh, a quarter to see. So and this is what's stated here. So the difference between a uh, half of t, so t was the double of uh, this sector, and the half of it is basically this sector, and p as the double of this polygon this we assume to be smaller than a quarter set, 
which is absolutely possible. And the same approach we go for the um, quadrilinear shape and the corresponding um, stair shape. So the same difference is being made up there. Also the difference between the stair shape and the curved quadrilinear shape is also be arranged in a way under the same context um, such that it is smaller than a quarter of a set or C. And <clears throat> since we know if we make up a series of these quantities we established now, namely uh, the Q and the P and the T, so Q being this one, P being either this one or the double of this one, and T being the double of the curved trilineum, <coughs> then we get to the fact that the uh, difference between the outer quantities according to proposition 2, 3, 4 and 5 can never be uh, larger than the sum of all differences. So this is a fact that has been established in Proposition 2 through Proposition 5, and this is something we know. <coughs> and now it becomes obvious that if the series is made up of this way, Q and uh, T, the difference between the outer quantities, uh, T minus Q, is what we established as set before. Yeah, and T minus Q as the outer quantities, we knew it can never be larger than the sum of all differences. And the sum of all differences is uh, three quarters of C. And this is established here. So, but since this is the case, and since we established already, uh, since it was our main assumption that uh, the difference set is the difference between <coughs> the double of the um, purple trilineum and the green quadrilineum, um, the, the, we get an at, uh, we get an abs absordum. So we get an equation which says that set is equal three quarters of set. And this is an uh, absurdum saying that there can't be any difference between the double of the purple curvy uh, sector and the green quadrilinear curvy uh, shape of the resecting figure. <coughs> But there is only one quantity which would fulfill this condition, set equals to three quarters of set, and that is if set equals zero. And set being this, the difference between the double of the purple one and the green area um, establishes that uh, these areas are actually equal. And that is how he indirectly proved that the relationship which we established on the basis of the um, polygon as a sum of uh, sectorial triangles and the uh, stair shape as a sum of um, <coughs> uh, elementary rectangles also is true when you go to the continuously curved areas of uh, the double trilineum and the quadrilinear shape. So by means of this very principle in the finite, he actually used or showed by this indirect proof that this principle is only also valid within uh, the curved uh, figures. And that is the very 
basis for uh, the whole treatment of the following propositions, namely that this uh, that these areas have a relationship to each other, which is that the double of this sector is equal <coughs> to the quadrilinear shape being produced by uh, the construction principle of the resecting figure. And this is a very important step from a principle established in the finite toward a principle that is valid also in the infinitesimally small, or if you will, in the treatment of uh, continuous curves. And it's uh, important to keep that in mind. <clears throat> and it's very revealing um, to read the scolium, which Leibniz also uh, provided in this proposition. And uh, I'm, I'm going to read it out now. So it will, uh, he, uh, he wrote, <clears throat> it will be appropriate to place two remarks here one concerning the proof and the other concerning the proposition itself. The proof is in so far special as it does not solve the problem by inscribing and circumscribing figures at the same time, but rather by only inscribed figures. So that's a difference to the proof of the method of exhaustion which was used by Archimedes and uh, others. <coughs> So, uh, I, Leibniz, frankly admit that I know of no way until now with which even only a single quadrature could be proven perfectly without deduction to ad absurdum. This is what we just did. So, we were proving that something is wrong instead of proving the direct way. So, on the contrary, I have reason to doubt that this will be possible without fictitious quantities due to the nature of these things. Fictitious quantities which can be accounted for as infinite or infinitely small. Yet I believe that among all these deductions ad absurdum there is no one more simple and natural being closer to a direct proof than which does not merely show that there is no difference between two quantities which makes them equal, while one is used to prove this by means of a twofold calculation which shows that the one is neither larger or nor smaller than the other one, but which also uses only one middle term, namely an inscribed one or a circumscribed one, but never both at the same time. Hence, it has the effect that we have a clear understanding of these things. Concerning the proposition itself, I reckon that it is one of the most general and useful in geometry, because it is so general that it can be used with any curve, even if the curve may be arbitrary and not be drawn according to any rule or law, and that if an arbitrary figure is given, it will reveal infinitely many more, the measurable extensions of which depends on the first one and the other way around. But it also can be counted to the most fruitful propositions in geometry, as from this point immediately the quadratures of all paraboloids and hyperboloids can be proven up to infinity, or rather, the quadrature of those figures at which their ordinates or their powers stand in a multiplicative or submultiplicative direct or reciprocal relation to their abscissas or the powers of their abscissas. Setting aside countless other solved or hypothetical quadratures, we do have, with the help of this proposition, in any case transformed the circle into a rational figure and an arbitrary cone section with a center into a rational figure. And from this point, we derive the arithmetic quadrature of the whole circle and an arbitrary part of it. And the true and perfect analytical expression of a circular arc from a given tangent. This very treatise is dealing with the proof of these matters.
Furthermore, because the most famous geometers who began to treat the cone sections thoroughly did not only use the naming ordinates at curves for parallel lines like C1B1 or C2B2 etc. as it is done usually, but also lines like AC1, AC2, AC3 etc. which are all aimed at the common point A which is done right even just because of the fact that parallel lines themselves, without any error, can be taken for convergent lines in that way, that one imagines the common intersection point to be infinitely far away, like the other focal point or the peak of the parabola. It is revealed here with the help of our proposition that there is a use for these new convergent ordinates for the quadrature and that the figure is not only resolved into parallelograms C1, B1, B2 or C2, B2, B3 and others by parallel ordinates as it used to be done by Cavalieri and most others after him but also by convergent ordinates it could also be resolved into triangles A, C1, C2 or A, C2, C3, etc. in infinitely many other ways, depending on the versatility of ways how to assume point A. This opens a vast field of new discoveries for which we provide the basics here, from which, as I know, no less and nothing smaller than these things can be derived. Yes, Leibniz is also giving a little preview here on the things which uh, were opened up by this relationship <coughs> that you can apply a principle which you established in the finite and uh, transport it also into the realm of infinity and still uh, use it uh, with uh, infinitely small quantities or infinitesimals so-called. Um, this is the very basis for what he developed later on as the calculus and uh, this is the very a thing that many people before him thought of but never had uh, the means to actually express it and uh, Leibniz was here laying the basis for the further development uh, of the calculus and therefore by developing the calculus, giving people uh, a means at hand to use these relationships of quadrating arbitrarily, arbitrary curves uh, at hand as, as a, as a quasi-mathematical operation. But this step required basically not only the uh, reliance on sense perception as such, but also was heavily focusing on the um, residence of principle. So, and the principles that are inherent in the finite and that are not visible and not graspable in the infinitely small or as well as the infinitely large, still can be known and derived from the infinite by the use of the creative part of our mind. And uh, this very work of Leibniz is a perfect example of this, that uh, by use of the uh, creative human mind that you can uh, know things which cannot be known merely by relying on our senses. And that's the whole purpose of uh, the quadrature of the circle. <clears throat> because uh, many people have dealt with the quadrature of the circle as a geometric problem. And um, the creator basically did not challenge us with this type of problem in order to uh, find a perfect solution, but rather to be constantly challenged uh, in a way that we also challenge ourselves. It is probably by no means 
a way to uh, accept the statement that uh, due to the transcendental nature of the circle that we will never be able to find a perfect quadrature and therefore should just uh, refrain from dealing with these problems. I think that's not the uh, purpose of, of, of the problem. The problem is, or the purpose is to constantly get challenged in order to challenge ourselves and the very systemic thinkings we, thinking we currently apply and uh, to challenge us to... Um, to, to change this thinking, to change the system, because that's the nature of the universe, um, that it is not uh, made up of uh, linear uh, developments which can be projected in the future. It is a matter of change. So even if a process itself changes, articulating it uh, itself as an expression of a curve, for instance. Uh, this is a, represents a change of the whole universe. And when you change this, and uh, when these kind of uh, changes take place, the whole, the universe as a whole changes. And uh, that's basically um, a, um, a viewpoint that uh, becomes very clear and very considerate in uh, the work of Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz and the main purpose of the quadrature is to challenge ourselves to find new principles and to hear, adhere to the fact that uh, it is our um, creative human mind that enables us to do so and that enables us also to challenge our current system. All right, so far for Proposition 7. I hope you enjoyed it a little. If it was too fast or too complex, uh, I encourage you to uh, watch it again because it's very essential and very uh, revealing also for the sake of dealing with the other propositions. I hope you enjoyed it and I see you soon in the next movie coming up dealing with Proposition 8. Thank you very much and bye-bye.